the construct of parental alienation is essentially a child-initiated cutoff in the child's relationship with a normal range and affectionately available parent. Um, and this typically occurs as part of high-conflict divorce. Now, in the mid-1980s, a psychiatrist, Richard Gardner, proposed a model. He recognized a clinical phenomena having to do with, with what he called parental alienation, and he proposed a model by which it could be identified. He referred to it as parental alienation syndrome. And he discussed a set of anecdotal clinical indicators by which it could be recognized. And he oft also went into describing how oftentimes in these situations uh, there are false allegations of child abuse uh, involved in this. His model, however, generated a great deal of controversy. Uh, first, because it moved beyond standard and accepted psychological principles, and he proposed this new syndrome uh, of clinical indicators that weren't really based in any standard or established psychological constructs or principles. And then secondly, by proposing that uh, parental alienation could often involve false allegations of child abuse, the whole dialogue and discussion went awry, away from parenting into child abuse allegations and those sorts of things. And so it's generated a lot of controversy, and uh, it's been about 30 years now, and it's still uh, semi-accepted uh, in, in the professional community. In my view, uh, Gardner's model of PAS, while he did identify a clinical phenomenon, it represents a failed paradigm. Uh, it's a failed le uh, legal paradigm because it fails to produce the changes necessary to solve the family problems. Families have to litigate whether or not there's parental alienation. That can take years and hundreds of thousands of dollars in attorney's fees. And if families can't litigate, then it simply um, is unsolvable. It's a failed theoretical paradigm because he too quickly abandoned established psychological constructs and principles and the rigor necessary to define what the clinical phenomenon is within those principles. And so by doing that, he's constructed a model that's founded on sort of the shifting sands of anecdotal clinical indicators. And so when we try to leverage his model in the legal system or in the mental health system, the sands shift beneath our feet and the whole structure collapses. We're not able to leverage the model because it's not based in established psychological constructs. It's a failed diagnostic model because he, by going to anecdotal clinical indicators rather than established constructs, it's hard to determine whether or not parental alienation exists. There's a, according to the current or his model, there are degrees of parental alienation. So it can be mild or moderate, severe, which makes it very hard to prove within the legal system. And there's a lot of controversy within mental health as to whether it's alienation or whether it's really what's called estrangement, uh, which is a problematic construct in itself. And it's a failed theoret uh, therapeutic paradigm because it does not tell us what to do about it. It's a new thing, parental alienation syndrome. It doesn't exist with any, within any established constructs. Whereas if we base our understanding within uh, standard, established, and accepted psychological principles and constructs, then those constructs lead us to what the therapy is. And so we can then understand the underlying foundations and uh, resolve the issues because we know what they are. So what I have done as I ran into this uh, tragic family cir circumstance, because my background is in you know, parent-child conflict, okay? I deal with the angry, grumpy kids, kids throwing chairs through the walls, uh, ADHD kinds of family conflicts. That's what I deal with in an everyday sort of way. And so I recognize what authentic parent-child conflicts looks like. And in my private practice, when I ran into this parental alienation, I, uh, it's fairly easy to recognize inauthentic conflict that's being induced through family relationships. But when I tried to uh, address these issues, the controversy surrounding parental alienation syndrome undermined the solution. And so I set about over the last couple of years of redefining what the construct is 
from within standard and established principles. So an attachment-based reformulation uh, of parental alienation offers uh, the foundation, a theoretical foundation that's grounded on the bedrock of established and accepted and scientifically supported principles that we can then use to leverage the legal uh, interventions and to leverage the therapeutic interventions necessary to solve this issue. An attachment-based uh, model of parental alienation provides the theoretical framework that can bring mental health back together into speaking with a single voice as to what it is, as opposed to this conflict, this conflict um, that currently occurs within the mental health field regarding whether parental alienation even exists, and if so, how to define it. So let me now turn to defining the theoretical foundations for this alternate paradigm to the Gardner's model. And this is the overall uh, structure of it that I will be explaining throughout the the seminar here today. It starts with a disorganized, preoccupied attachment of the alienating parent that led the alienating parent to develop personality disorder uh, pathology, centering around narcissistic borderline personality dynamics. Now don't get too hung up on the labels or the categories, because increasingly personality disorders are being understood as having their roots in the attachment system. And they're dimensional, they're not categorical. And so don't get too hung up on the actual labels. Um, more so, the labels are just sort of descriptive categories or descriptive shorthand to be able to talk about some of the features. Also, um, Kernberg, one of the leading figures in personality disorders, recognized that narcissistic and borderline personality dynamics are sort of flip sides of the same coin. Underneath, in the attachment system, they're the same dynamic, but they just have different outward manifestations for various reasons. So the disorganized, preoccupied attachment of the alienating parent during childhood constellated into personality disorder traits, uh, narcissistic and borderline. It also involves a, an attachment trauma, a relationship trauma embedded in the neurological networks of the narcissistic borderline parent. And that trauma is going to be reenacted in the parental alienation. The attachment system mediates both uh, bonding relationships and also the loss of those relationships. So when the divorce occurred, we have a reactivation of the alienating parent's attachment system to mediate that loss experience. And so all of those trauma networks having to do with internal working models of attachment also get reactivated. And so it's this complex blend of personality disorder dynamics and attachment trauma that get, then get reenacted in the current family, family situation. So in organizing the theoretical foundations, there are three levels to an, uh, analysis of what's going on. And so it can seem complex at first, but if we kind of look at the different layers of things, we can get greater clarity on what's taking place. So at the surface level, there's a family systems dynamics. Okay, and so I'll talk about those in a second, of what the family system relationships look like. Underneath those, and driving those family systems processes, are the personality disorder dynamics. Underneath those, are the attachment uh, system problems and the attachment trauma. So starting with the family systems level. From a family systems theory, uh, families go through transitions. Uh, so the, for example, the, the birth of the first child creates a transition for the family. Uh, the growth of the child maturation into pre or to school years uh, or into adolescence where we had now have an adult, a new adult in the family, or the launching of the child into adulthood. All of those periods involve transitions in the family. And if a family fails to make a successful transition, symptoms emerge. Well, the divorce and uh, dissolution of the marriage represents another transition in the family. And so that's where this family, from a family systems perspective, is having difficulty. They're not transitioning 
in the family's transition, not successfully transitioning, to the loss of the marriage. And just because the marriage dissolves doesn't mean the family dissolves. Because once you have children, the family remains forever. Because what's happening is the family is transitioning from an intact family structure that's united by the marriage, and because of the conflict or drifting apart of the spouses, the family transitions to a separated family structure that is now united by the children. Okay, so the marriage is dissolved, but the family hasn't. Now, in successful transitions, the parents are able to resolve their conflict and animosity and allow the child to serve their unifying function as you know, the parental roles of mother and father remain, even though the spousal roles have ended. In conflicted families, though, there's, when the parents cannot resolve their conflict, that provides this um, splitting energy or this con conflict energy that's dividing the family while the child is trying to serve their role uniting the family and so the child can experience that inner conflict and we wind up with a whole bunch of symptoms in the child. In some cases, in pathological cases, there's a split uh, in the relationships, a cutoff in the family relationships, and so that the parental relationships mirror the cutoff in the spousal relationships. The person becomes an ex-husband as well as an ex-father, and that's what parental alienation involves. It's a cutoff in the family relationships as a means to manage the, the family conflict in the situation. So the reason for the difficulty, to drop a little bit down, in this. The reason for the difficulty in the family making the transition is because there's an underlying uh, narcissistic personality structure in one of the parents. The narcissist, there's two features about narcissism that are going to make it difficult for the family to transition. First, the narcissist is characterologically unable to experience sadness and grief. That's just not capable for them. The second is the splitting dynamic that occurs in, uh, with both narcissistic and borderline personality dynamics. So in terms of the narcissist's inability to experience grief, Kernberg talks about that. They say, they, the narcissist, are especially def uh, deficient in the genuine feelings of sadness and mournful longing. Their incapacity for experiencing depressive reactions is a basic feature of their personalities. When abandoned or disappointed by other people, they may show what on the surface looks like depression, but which on further examination emerges as anger and uh, resentment loaded with revengeful wishes, rather than real sadness for the loss of the person whom they appreciated. So the narcissistic parent is unable to genuinely experience loss and sadness. And what happens is they, uh, influence the child to interpret the child's own loss and sadness at the loss of the intact family structure in the same way the narcissistic parent is, as anger and resentment towards the other parent. And typically the narcissistic parent frames for the child, it's the other parent who's responsible for the divorce. Now we'd like for people to avoid that, but the narcissist doesn't do that. They engage the child and tell the child it's the other parent. Meanwhile, the targeted parent says, well, it's both of us, and they don't give the child a reason. And so the child adopts the belief system of the narcissistic parent, because they're not hearing any differently, that it's the other parent who was responsible for the divorce. And so and in that process, the narcissistic parent can, uh, influences the child to interpret the child's authentic grief and sadness as anger and resentment against the other parent. <laughs> The second feature about the narcissistic borderline parent that inhibits the ability of the family to transition is the splitting dynamic. The splitting, um, to understand its core foundation, it's within the attachment system that is the origins of splitting. And what happens in the attachment system, in the attachment relationship, is the child experiences a parent who is simultaneously both nurturing, activating attachment bonding motivations, and frightening, activating avoidance motivations. So a frightening parent, the child seeks to flee from that parent and seek protection with the protective parent who happens to be the frightening parent. And so the child is caught in this conflict where the parent is simultaneously 
frightening and the source of nurturance. And so you have the simultaneous activation of these two bonding motivations. Various studies, from Beck and all, Aaron Beck, Various studies have found that patients with borderline personality disorder are characterized by disorganized attachment re representations. Such attachment uh, uh, representations appear to be typical for persons with unresolved childhood traumas, especially when parental figures in, were involved with direct frightening behavior by the parent. Disorganized attachment is to consider to result from an unresolvable situation for the child when the parent is at the same time the source of fright as well as a potential haven of safety. So what happens for these kids is that because they have both systems activated at the same time, attachment bonding motivations and avoidance motivations, they psychologically split those two motivating systems so that they're only one is on at any given time. At a neurological level, what's happening is you're getting, you're not actually splitting physically, you're getting an intensive inhibition, cross inhibition. So when the attachment bonding motivations are on, they entirely inhibit the avoidance motivations. When the avoidance motivations are on, they entirely inhibit the, the bonding motivations. So that for most of us, uh, we can have both systems on at the same time. We can you know, have bonding motivations on and avoidance motivations on and recognize that people are a blend of good and bad. Now, if I mostly think you're good, I'm going to get a little halo effect and I'm going to see a lot of good things about you, but I still recognize there's problems. Or if I don't like you, I'm going to see a lot of bad things about you, but I'm still going to recognize there's some good things about you because both systems can be on simultaneously. However, for the narcissistic borderline parent or the disorganized attachment, that's not possible. One system on or the other system on. That's what we see as splitting. So either you're idealized as all wonderful or you're demonized as all horrible. So what this, the implications for this in the divorce with a narcissistic borderline parent is that they are unable to maintain this ambiguity of relationships. So the ex-husband must become the ex-father. The ex-mother must become the ex, or the ex-wife uh, must become the ex-mother. They cannot allow, they, they just can't experience that I don't like you as a spouse, but the child can like you as a parent. That's not capable for their neurological structure. Additional level of family systems um, understanding for this process has to do with triangulation of the child. A lot of literature on this, Mnuchin, Haley, Bowen, others, that when there's conflict in the family, some, or in the spousal relationship, sometimes the child is drawn into the spousal conflict. It's referred to as triangulation. There's two types of triangulation that can occur. The first is when the two parents unite against the child. In that case, the child is referred to as the identified patient, and the child's acting out behavior serves to bring the parents together in a coalition against the child, and so can oftentimes save a troubled marriage. And so if, the, if it wasn't for the child acting out, the parents may split up, but the child serves to, to uh, maintain the marriage. The second type of coalition is referred to as a cross-generational coalition. This involves a parent-child coalition against the other parent, in which the one parent channels their anger at the other parent through the child, and so could covertly express their anger towards the other parent and the child. It's referred to as a cross-generational coalition. Uh, Jay Haley refers to it as a perverse triangle because it's crossing generational boundaries. The Haley defines what a cross-generational coalition is. The people responding to each other in the triangle um, are not peers, but they're from a different generation. One is from a different generation than the other two. Uh, in the process of uh, their interaction together, the person of one generation forms a coalition with the person of the other generation. So the parent forms a coalition with the child. By coalition is meant a process of joint action, which is against the third person. The coalition between the two persons is denied. And so this idea of asking the child in parental alienation, is your parent influencing you? No, the child's gonna say no. The coalition is denied. 
We know that ahead of time. It's, it's, it's pointless to ask, is the other parent influencing you? It's going to be denied. That is, um, there is a certain behavior which indicates a coalition, which when it is queried will be not denied as a coalition. In essence, the perverse triangle is one in which the separation of generations is breached in a covert way. When this occurs as a repetitive pattern, the system will be pathological. Now this coalition across generations is extraordinarily destructive. That uh, Kerrig, who talks about um, you know, the breakdown of the parent-child relationship or the, the enmeshment of parent-children, the breakdown of appropriate generational boundaries between parents and children significantly increases the risk for emotional abuse. When parent-child boundaries are violated, the implications for developmental psych psychopathology are significant. Poor boundaries interfere with the child's capacity to progress through development, which, as Anna Freud suggested, is the defining feature of childhood psycho psychopathology. A theme that appears to be central to the conceptualization of boundary dissolution is the failure to acknowledge the psychological distinctiveness of the child. That is going to be particularly uh, vulnerability to narcissistic parents. Kerry goes on to talk about that. Rather than telling the child directly what to do, I think. Okay. Do it. We're going to hold this on real good. Sorry about that. Okay. okay. You're good to go. Okay. So rather than telling the child directly what to do or think, as does the behaviorally controlling the parent, the psychologically controlling parent uses indirect hints that respond with guilt induction or withdrawal of love if the child refuses to comply. So the, the narcissistic parent isn't just controlling the child's behavior, they're controlling the child psychologically. In short, an intrusive parent strives to manipulate the child's thoughts and feelings in such a way that the child's psyche will conform to the parent's wishes. In order to carve out an island of safety and uh, responsivity in an unpredictable, harsh, and depriving parent-child relationship, children of highly maladaptive parents may become precocious caregivers uh, who are uh, adept at reading the cues and meeting the needs of those around them. The ensuing preoccupied attachment with the parent interferes with the child's development of important ego functions such as self-organization, affect regulation, emotional object constancy. So the child in parental alienation is actually taking care of the alienating parent. What appears to be an, a bond between the two of them is actually a manifestation of an insecure attachment, a preoccupied attachment, where the child is being engaged in a role reversal relationship of being used of what's called a regulatory object for the psychopathology of the alienating parent. So the bonded relationship is not a good thing. It's not really, look, it's not a healthy relationship. Although superficially, it looks like, oh, isn't everything wonderful? So let's drop down a level to the personality disorder uh, dynamics that are involved. And first off, there's an association between narcissistic and borderline personality. Uh, Kernberg talks about one subgroup of borderline patients, namely the narcissistic personalities, seem to have a defensive organization similar to borderline conditions, and yet many of them function on a much higher psychosocial level. The uh, defensive organization of these patients, the, the narcissist, is quite similar to that of borderline personality in general. What distinguishes many of the patients with narcissistic personalities from the usual borderline patient is their relatively good social functioning, their better impulse control, and the capacity for active, consistent work in some areas that permits them to partially fulfill their ambitions of greatness and obtaining admirations from others. So there's an association, uh, underlying association, between narcissistic and borderline processes. As we've come to understand the attachment system, we can understand that association much better at the lower level of the attachment system. In addition, uh, personality disorders go across categories. So Milan talks about several personality disorders co-vary with the narcissistic spectrum, uh, various personality disorders as well as borderline. So we see those two show up a lot. And then 
suspect, and I'll talk about how borderline personalities can uh, be associated with as many as five other different personality structures. So don't get too hung up on the categories. Just recognize that there's an underlying uh, narcissistic borderline personality structure. Now for the narcissist, uh, to talk about what their core dynamics are, Beck refers to it as schemas, um, Bowlby refers to them as internal working models. The failure to be superior or regarded as special activates underlying beliefs of inferiority, unimportance, or powerlessness, and compensatory strategies of self-protection and self-defense. The core belief of the narcissistic personality is, uh, is of an in, uh, inferiority or unimportance. This belief is activated only under certain circumstances and thus may be observed mainly in the resp response to conditions of self-esteem threat. Otherwise, the manifest uh, belief is a compensatory attitude of superiority. So until the divorce takes place, these, people, these parents may appear fine. Okay, nobody recognizes a narcissist. They're, they're involved in the community, they're kind of grandiose, they present well, they're articulate, maybe even intelligent. It's when the vulnerability hits, the divorce, which is spot on to the inferiority. The, the parent is being rejected as a spouse. And oh, then you get the full display of their narcissistic borderline process. Milan talks about the decompensation of a narcissist. Under conditions of unrelieved adversity and failure, narcissists may decompensate into paranoid disorders. Owing to their excessive use of fantasy mechanisms, they are disposed to misinterpret events and to construct delusional beliefs. Unwilling to accept the constraints on their independence and unable to accept the viewpoints of others, narcissists may isolate themselves from the corrective effects of shared thinking. Alone they may ruminate and weave their beliefs into a network of fanciful and totally invalid suspicions. Among narcissists, delusions often form after a serious challenge or setback has upset their image of superiority and omnipotence. Can we say divorce? They tend to uh, exhibit compensatory grandiosity and jealousy delusions in which they reconstruct reality to match the image they are unable and unwilling to give up. Delusional systems may also develop as, uh, as a result of having felt betrayed and humiliated. Again, that's spot on to divorce. Here we may see the rapid unfolding of persecutory delusions and an arrogant grandiosity characterized by verbal attacks and bombast. So we're not just talking sort of normal brain psychopathology here. There's an underlying delusional process that's occurring, and I'll talk about that more as we get into the attachment trauma that takes place. 